everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Yes, I am back in Minneapolis. Great to be with you. And uh, I just got off my flight. So it was a little bit of a long day. Uh, Kevin O'Connell spoke today starting at 7.45 a.m. Eastern, which is a terrible time zone. And if you are in Eastern time, I don't think you would be offended by this if you had spent time in God's time zone, which is central. Central is the proper time zone that was meant by the universe. I believe Ben Franklin wrote that. Uh, but uh, in Eastern time, it's a little bit of a struggle for me every single time to adapt. And so six o'clock or so this morning when I woke up Eastern time was pretty intense after uh, going to the event last night that they had at the owners meetings. So then I go over to the Ritz Carlton. I wasn't staying at the Ritz Carlton because more of you need to subscribe. So next year I'm staying at the Ritz Carlton. Am I right? Uh, more watch time equals more travel opportunities. But uh, so anyway, got up, went over to the Ritz Carlton. Uh, where they were having this breakfast that they always have every year. And that's basically what I went for that and our sit down one-on-ones with the owner and Kevin O'Connell. And then O'Connell talks and we're kind of in a circle around him and then other people kind of pop in. So a couple of dolphins reporters came in and said, how do you like Andrew Van Ginkle? And then somebody else came up from the Broncos and then said, Hey, do you uh, want to trade up and beat the Broncos to the punch? And so that's kind of how it works. We get in our questions other people from national media or other markets who want to talk to Kevin O'Connell come up and it lasts for about 45 minutes. And then I got done with that at, I don't know, it must've been eight 45, nine o'clock in the morning and looked around and went, you know what? I don't have a lot more to do here. So I recorded a short podcast, which you can find with a couple of guys from Denver. And then I moved up my flight and I jumped on a little sun country action, flew back, but weather, uh, caused some issues for me. So they had to do the thing. And I don't know how many of you have ever had this happen, but the runway needed to be cleared off. So they had to do this thing where they just flew around. It's sort of like driving around the block, waiting for the girl that you're picking up for a date to get ready. Just like, all right, we'll just go around the block till she's ready. Uh, this is exactly what we were doing. We were just driving around the block until they were ready to have us. And that was probably an extra hour onto the flight. I also learned that it is spring break for a lot of children who were going to Disney. So this flight had a lot of children on it. And I'm sure you all love your children. I'm sure they're wonderful, but you also are probably well aware that for flying purposes, it's not always ideal. So it was an extra hour tacked on up early in the morning flight. My point is, this is how important it is that what's going on with the Minnesota Vikings right now, because there was no way I wasn't still going to go live and chat with all you people about everything that is going on with the Vikings, especially after what Robert Kraft said, which is where we're going to start the show tonight. And we'll get to your comments in a bit. I'm going to run down the different things from the owners meetings, and then we'll get into uh, you know some back and forth here. But I want to start with Robert Kraft. So Robert Kraft, via our friend Chad Graff, formerly of the Vikings beat, and now with the New England Patriots covering them for the athletic, this is what the owner of the New England Patriots had to say about the possibility of a trade-up. Quote, when I put my fan hat on, I definitely would, referring to pick a quarterback. On the other hand, a lot of people can be really desperate to move up so we'll be open. Oh, you'll be open. So now that this goes to two different bits, one bit was just suggested by, and now, and, and I've, I'm playing around with this system a little bit suggested by Nick longtime listener slash watcher rumor of the day. I have a ticker now on the bottom. If you're watching live that says rumor of the day. So this could be rumor of the day. Although is it a rumor? If the owner just says it straight out, we're open. Sure, make us an offer, Minnesota Vikings. But of course, I'm sure that also means make us a very good offer, make us a very expensive offer, but make one. Uh, he's, he's saying it. So maybe it's not a rumor. I don't know if it qualifies as a rumor. Instead, it might qualify as our other bit for the next month as we lead up to the draft, which is smokescreen or not. Nah. 
is this a smoke screen that Robert Kraft is saying will be open? I, again, it's the owner. It doesn't feel like a smoke screen when it's Robert Kraft saying it, but I think what he's probably strongly insinuating to the Minnesota Vikings and any other team is that it's it's not a it's not a smoke screen and it's not really a rumor. So neither applies. But I just wanted to show off that I figured out how to do a ticker, and I've got another one that's good for uh, after nine o'clock when people give crazy quarterback takes. I've got this one: silly quarterback take alert. That is also going to run across the bottom of the screen. Uh, but we, we'll see how long we have to go each night before using the silly quarterback ticker. I think that with this, we were wondering, would they do it for some insane package? I am inclined to believe the owner when he comes out and says, maybe see how good you can do and how good you can do might not be good enough. Their personnel people who make the decisions, Elliot Wolf now and Gerard Mayo, they might be like, Bobby, Bobby, this isn't your worst decision ever. If you know, you know, but it's a bad decision to say that. Now we're going to get all these phone calls. Now everyone's going to be thinking we're trading out and we actually want Drake May or we actually want JJ McCarthy. But I think that he's telling the truth. I don't think it's a smoke screen. It's just, he's got to be putting it out there to say, let's up those prices. Or is he not showing his cards or trying not to, but accidentally showing his cards that there's already something that they're on the way to. And he's trying to prepare his fans a little bit because he says, and I thought that the phrasing and look, when it's rumor of the day, it's running across the bottom. When it's rumor of the day, we're going to break it down in extremes because that's where we're at right now with this thing is it's going to be a lot of rumors leading up to the draft. But the way that this is phrased, when I put my fan hat on, I definitely would pick a quarterback. Like, so wait, football people are always saying, hey, if you start listening to the fans, you'll be sitting with them. Now, of course, Robert Kraft owns the entire team, so he actually does sit with the fans. But normally there's this feeling of, Hey, you can't listen to the fans. They're overreactionary. They're crazy. Those fans, they don't know what they're talking about. We are the less reactionary, more planned out strategizing tactical football men. So there's a little bit of vibe here of this as we're going way too far in analyzing it that like, Hey, is he talking like preparing fans? I know you guys are crazy. And I know you guys want a quarterback, but hold your horses because someone got really desperate and we said yes to them because they're crazy. They're the wacky Vikings. They want to give up everything for this quarterback. And we are too smart and wise and tactical. And I think that what it comes down to is what that price is. Then if Robert Kraft is saying it, that they are potentially willing, but you got to be crazy. What is crazy is crazy 11, 23 and next year's first. Cause to me, that's not that crazy. And Kevin O'Connell mentioned something today. I believe it was today where he said something about it, like a historical precedent for what it costs to move up in the draft. And we know what that historical precedent is because we all saw the San Francisco 49ers trade up for Trey Lance. And that cost them was that three first. I don't have it right in front of me, but I think it was three first, right? So we know that to make this move, that's usually the price. So is, is Bobo Kraft saying, Hey, you got to go crazier than San Francisco did for Trey Lance. Or is that what he's referring to? Somebody get us those three first round draft picks. And everyone's like, I don't know, Robert, please. Can you not, uh, you know, but I, the one thing I would say about the way that this owner's meetings went with Kevin O'Connell, Mark Wilf, they were all kind of grinning about the same thing. I mean, that it everyone knows what they want. It's just, can they pull it off? They couldn't even really lie about it to us. When we're asking about the quarterbacks, we're talking about these trade-ups. They couldn't even bring themselves to say, hey guys, like we we might not be interested in doing that. I mean, they they're trying. There, that's why they got 23. There's no question about it. We all knew it on the day that it happened, but I feel like 
the the big holdup for me of whether they could actually pull this off is whether New England would be willing and open to do it. So now what we've heard is number three, four, and five have all made statements, whether it's from the general manager or now from the owner, which is obviously the most important person at the top of the organization, three, four, and five are saying, come get us. So if you're the Vikings, you have to work on three first to give you your potential quarterback, but this could also, I hate to say this because I want this emergency podcast to happen like tomorrow. They could also wait until draft day and they could have an if then type of scenario. Like let's say for example, Hey, new England, if they pick Jaden Daniels, bang, push that button three first Drake may comes to us. If they pick Drake may, sorry guys, we're actually going to number four. And that is realistic that you've heard of before of teams hatching trades only if it works in a certain type of way. So how do we feel? You know what we're going to have to come back with? We're going to have to invent. All right. I'm going to invent this right now with my new little system. Uh, let's see. Here we go across the bottom of the screen. Trade up meter. We had the Kirk meter for what percentage that I thought Kirk was leaving. And that thing kind of wavered all over the place as uh, we went along during that process. But now we need a trade up meter. So where am I percentage wise on a trade up? And after what Robert Kraft said, after the owners meetings, after there almost felt like a little bit of nod, nod, wink, wink, like keep your notifications on your phone. I'm, I'm going to go like 60%, maybe 65. Give me yours in the comments, I'm 65, 70%. The Vikings are moving up to make this happen. I still come back to, they don't get number 23 unless they knew it. They keep saying flexibility and Kevin O'Connell keeps saying, Hey, you know, there's so many offensive players at the top of this draft that we could always get the best defensive player and then wait for a quarterback. Um, I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. But if they did stay at 11 and 23, that would be true that they could, but that's where, that's where I'm at right now. I came out of Orlando at the owner's meetings feeling more like they'll trade up than they won't. That's as of this moment. So whether that actually plays out, I, I guess we'll see, uh, when it plays out, I guess we'll see, but that's going to be a daily thing now is the trade up meter. And I am feeling more on the confident side that they can do the most in comparison to Denver and other competitors to possibly trade up. So give me yours and your scenarios that you like and whether you'd be okay with those three firsts or if you think, or would you be okay with more? That's really the question. Would you be okay with more than three firsts? And I don't know what that looks like. Is it three, is it three firsts and a player? Is it three firsts and uh, I don't know, what do they have left? A third round pick from 2025? I mean, that's, that's going really crazy. So how, how far are you willing to go? Where's your percentages? Leave me in the comments there. I mean, I want to run through a, a few other things from the owners meetings. I want to celebrate the XFL kickoff has arrived and this is for OG listeners slash watchers. You know how often I've brought this up that there's this disappearance of the kick returner. I brought this up when I was chatting with Mark Wilf before our interview the other day. I was like, look, I, I miss, I miss the Mo Williams, the Kadri Ismails, the David Palmers, the Cordero Patterson's like of any era, the Vikings have had these good kick returners and they're just gone. And look, the Vikings have a great one in Kenny Wong. he never gets to touch the ball. So if you haven't seen the way the XFL kickoff works is you have the guys line up only if, a few yards away from each other, like a play, the kicker has to kick it into the quote landing zone. The returner, when he catches it, everybody blocks each other. And then you can create plays off it and so forth. Go check it out. Adam Schefter tweeted it and shout out to my friend, Sam Schwartzstein, who in 2021, I did an article with Sam Schwartzstein, who invented the XFL kickoff about why Vikings fans should be rooting for it. And I talked to Kadri Ismail, talked to Mo Williams and I really enjoyed doing that story. And I've sort of followed it all the way through of this, like, let's get that play back in. So another thing to leave in the comments, I'd love to see. I had a lot of people respond on Twitter to this today was favorite kick returners ever. Doesn't have to be a Viking, but just 
guy you really loved watching. For me, it was Eric Metcalf, Mel Gray, guys like that. I won't steal all the names, but there's been a lot of them through history. And now what this does, it's going to look weird at first. I will say that it will look weird, but you'll get used to it. And now that playmaker position is back. And think about like when the Vikings put Adrian Peterson in for a kick return one time, they put in Randy Moss. Was it against the Packers? And he returned one for a touchdown. How about, Hey, there's like five seconds left in a game or something. And you're getting a kickoff. They got, I mean, I don't know, whatever it is, not five seconds, but the end of a game, you're down by seven points and you're going to maybe get a chance to actually return this one. This is going to bring the returns up. So maybe you throw back there, you know, Aaron Jones or something to see if he can do something crazy. I don't know. Uh, but it's not going to completely eliminate the touchback. It's still possible. It does eliminate the surprise on onside kick. Sorry. You know, there are consequences, but it gets it back in the game. I've just, been so exhausted of watching footballs fly through the goalposts on kickoffs after touchdowns. Think about how long it is in real time. If you're in the stadium where there's a touchdown and they're playing, let's go. Like, da, 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 da. When's the next time you see a play? Is it like 12 minutes? I mean, it feels like it's forever until you see a play again. Now you got to stay in your seat. So congratulations to uh, Sam Schwartzstein. Uh, of the inventor of the XFL kickoff and the NFL for being bold here and the NFL owners for being bold. I'm glad they're doing it. I know some of you are going to think it's crazy. You're going to hate it. You're going to say, Oh, I don't like this. I want the old kickoff back, but the old kickoff was a death bowl. So they had to figure out a way to have a kickoff without it being a death bowl. And I think they found the best possible way and teams are going to get inventive and it's going to be fun. And they'll probably kill it after a year because it's too fun. Uh, anyway, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how everybody likes it. I'll be curious to look at the feedback when that actually happens. From this morning, sit down with Kevin O'Connell. A thing that stuck out to me, aside from more quarterback talk, he didn't really break any new ground with the quarterback talk. Uh, I asked him about how his experience as a former quarterback played into or plays into how he approaches this process of meeting with quarterbacks and things like that. And he said that one of his main goals is for all these guys to walk away and say, I'd love to play for that, for that coach, because I know how attentive that coach is going to be to what I need as a young quarterback. And, you know, I mean, the, the leadership element's going to be difficult as a rookie quarterback, but when the head coach is, working directly with you and has your back the way he did with Kirk Cousins, I think it helps. If you are a quarterback who comes into a team with a defensive head coach that kind of ignores you and say, go over there, uh, you know, then it's probably harder to grab the reins. And really, we saw this from Kirk Cousins. He wasn't a rookie, but it took until O'Connell got here for him to take the reins of leadership within that locker room. And I think if you're Drake May or you're J.J. McCarthy, then you're going to be empowered to do that right away. Uh, and also work with someone who knows really well how this all works. And I just get the impression that Kevin O'Connell looks back at his experience in the NFL and thinks people could have done better for me. That's the idea that I get. And his mistreatment or his difficult circumstances coming into the league many years ago uh, might play into sort of how he approaches this and learning from the mistakes that were made before. Cause he's talked about, going to a team that had Tom Brady. There's no development there. He's talked about uh, playing for the Jets. And, you know, that wasn't a really great situation for quarterback development necessarily. So now he is able to do it his way. And I think that that helps any of these quarterbacks. But that's what he's going to be doing over this next month. It's not going to be too many vacations for O'Connell. It's going to be meeting with these quarterbacks. Um, another thing he said that stuck out to me, or two things actually, was on the defensive side. And I know what has happened when I've talked about any other position in the roster uh, <laughs> is people are like, all right, let's get back to the quarterback talk. We will, I promise. But uh, on the defensive side, they signed uh, Shaquille Griffin. And he, uh, what um, Kevin O'Connell said about that was that he's hoping that it allows Byron Murphy to move back inside. And this is why last year he played all outside corner this is why last year I was not very critical of Byron Murphy's play because they brought Byron Murphy here 
to be a nickel corner. That was entirely the plan. And that's where he had thrived before. He had better numbers as a nickel. And then Josh Metellus happened. And suddenly it was, well, we've got this hybrid guy and we don't have anybody else on the outside. So now you got to go play out there. But he said, like, this gives them more flexibility to move Murphy inside more often. And maybe we're going to see paired with, he also talked about Harrison Smith playing way too many snaps and absolutely did. He was playing banged up. He was at 1100 snaps or something crazy like that. So now maybe you have Metellus playing with Bynum for some series and Harrison Smith not having to play every single down. It is crazy how many snaps some of those guys took last year because of their lack of depth. Uh, I got that impression that you could move Metellus back. You could slide Murphy into the nickel position a little more often where he's more strong. I still am not really sure about that other cornerback position. If Brian Flores told me truthfully, Hey, a Caleb Evans and Andrew Booth jr. I want to see them battle it out. I believe in both of them. Let's see it. All right. Well, it's that kind of year where I want more younger players to get their opportunities because I would have never thought that Josh Metellus, though. I, I mean, liked what he had done in the past as a special teamer and as a fill-in player, I never would have thought that Josh Metellus would be a star would be like getting pro bowl votes and making a huge difference in the game. But Brian Flores saw that as soon as he got here, which is why you have Brian Flores. Uh, I didn't think that myself, but he's better at identifying defensive talent. So he finds this position for Josh Metellus. Well, now that gives you an opportunity uh, to be a little more flexible in the back end, but also he might have the same feeling about one of the cornerbacks and he might want to give them time and he might want to work with them a little bit more before they totally bail. I still think they need a star corner that they need someone who is like a Legereus need, not that expensive, someone who can really be locked up with a star receiver all day and not get dominated. They still don't have that. And you shouldn't be overly excited about Griffin considering he's just been a rotational okay player in recent years. And I know that some people have said, oh, it was a depth issue that they cut him. But if somebody can play, they're going to keep them on the team. And, oh, well, you know, as a special teams that, that look, you, a guy gets cut in the middle of the season. You go, all right, I don't know about this, but I'll believe in Brian Flores again. Uh, so we'll see how that works out at one point in his career. Griffin was quite good. And, uh, that hasn't been the case most recently. So they still have corner as a need. If they were to stay at 11, 23 and take a corner at 23, it would not be insane. Um, but I thought that was an interesting note. And on the interior of the defensive line, it doesn't look like there's going to be an opportunity unless they pick at 11 or 23 and take that position to get a difference maker. So it's just going to be a lot more rotation. And if you're playing Jonathan Bullard, 400 snaps, Harrison Phillips, 550, 600, mixing in Jerry Tillery and Jonah Williams, you still don't feel great about it, but at least it's not last year where you had those guys playing every snap. Still, defensive tackles do get banged up, and that is a position where you're just, you're just going to need more assets. You're going to need more money. You're going to need more uh, cap space uh, in 2025, which they'll get. And you're going to need more draft picks and all that stuff. So the impact defensive tackle, the dream of the purple insider podcast uh, seems to be on hold still, but at very least they're going to have a rotation and we'll see if they get a chance to take that defensive player at some point. Uh, Greg Joseph is a Packer. This is a headline. It's an important headline because what's going to happen is in December Vikings in the playoff race, they have a two point lead. With one minute to go, Jordan Love completes a pass to get the Packers to the 43-yard line. In the snow, Greg Joseph lines up and bangs through a 60-yarder to eliminate the Minnesota Vikings from the playoffs. Put it down in pen right now. That's what's going to happen. It's the only way this can play out if Greg Joseph is playing for the Packers. I was trying to think about whether he's kicked well in Green Bay. I, I don't have much recollection. I don't think so. I don't think it's been like exceptional, but I can't remember every kick from green Bay. Uh, I guess the Vikings have a new kicker and I don't know if he's the guy who's on the roster. Now I forget his name. He's got three names. It's uh Romo is his last name. Somebody's going to have to correct me on who this 
punt kicker is. I, I haven't been focused on that uh, as much. Oh, John Parker Romo. Okay, I, I, I thought I was getting it. Yeah, he's from the XFL. I don't think he'll be the only one. There will be undrafted free agents, maybe a seventh round pick or something that competes. But we know that it won't be Greg Joseph. So he defects to the Packers. The Vikings got Aaron Jones. They got Greg Joseph. Fair trade off. Uh, one last thing before I get to your questions and comments. Uh, Mike Tannenbaum of ESPN, distra- uh, I guess he decided to drop a Tannenbaum. Sorry. Does this count as rumor of the day? Or does this count as silly quarterback take alert? You decide. Uh, Mike Tannenbaum in his latest mock has the Vikings acquiring Kyler Murray. Personally, I think this would have had to have happened already if they were going to do it. But I guess you never know. Usually a trade like that happens early in the process before free agency. So the quarterback can get in, start learning the offense and you know, taking that position over. We've seen the quarterback movement happen already this year. Matthew Stafford, I think, was traded in February or January when that happened. But uh, here's what I will give Mike Tannenbaum and why I will not call it silly quarterback take alert. One, if you were, if you were telling me that the Vikings couldn't get one, two or three, and it was McCarthy or Kyler Murray, I'm taking Kyler Murray. He had a bad situation in Arizona is 2021 season. Make sure you go back and look at it before you freak out. It was really, really good. And uh, who did he have there? Oh yeah. An elite wide receiver, Deandre Hopkins, who uh, surprisingly was at the party I was at last night. It's very weird. And walking around, it was like Ryan Fitzpatrick, Vince Carter was there for some reason. It was like a fever dream. Uh, but anyway, when Kyler Murray in 2021 was at his best, he was dominating with Deandre Hopkins. If he were to come here and I know the contract, Hey, do we want to get into that contract thing? Yes. Major holdup. Don't love that. You can restructure his because he signed a longer term deal. The whole Kirk thing was always two tiered. It was, well, you can't pay him that much. And it was, oh, we're, you're paying him X per year. The real problem was when you take a short term, fully guaranteed contract, every time you have to pay all of it, it doesn't give you much flexibility. That means if you want to lower the cap hit, you got to do restructures, not just, or you have to work with him to rework the contract, not just one of those translate bonus money to base salary or however that, whichever way that goes. Uh, It's been a few years since they were doing that all the time, but that's pretty normal. If you're moving money from bonus, is it bonus to base salary, but you can move money around to lower the guy's cap hit in a restructure, but you don't have to renegotiate. That's the word I was looking for with Kirk. You have to renegotiate. If you're going to move money around oftentimes with his deals, because they were short term. So he always had these huge cap hits for Murray. There are restructure opportunities just like Kansas city did with Patrick Mahomes. I don't love, love, love it because I like more the idea of the rookie quarterback contract. I think there's more room for error with the rookie quarterback contract, especially if they pick at 11 and use their own pick. But I like that Mike Tannenbaum went for something. The the mock drafts, they all just become the same mock draft. You don't have to read two. You just read one. There's a comparison there that might be like not kid friendly, but like there was a there was an old joke. I won't say the whole thing, but it's like, do we really need to make more of that? It's like the same thing. Like, do we really need to do more mocks? Can we just have like three guys? What if we nominated mock drafters? That's what we really need. Like we nominate them and we announce the dates that their mocks come out. So we got Brugler, we got Kuiper and we got, you know, whatever. And we got Joe, like you get to win mocker of the year. So Joe and then Mel Kuiper and Dane Brugler, and they do their mocks. And that's the only ones in the world because everybody's just copying two out of those anyway. So the point just being that I like that Mike Tannenbaum took a shot at something else. I don't think it has a whole lot of realism to it. We do know that these trades come out of absolutely nowhere if they're going to happen. And I would rather have Kyler Murray than JJ McCarthy that I think that he still has way more there than he's hit on. He's not old. He had an ACL, but that happens and came back looking pretty good. So that, and look, if they did it, 
It would be crazy. It would be one of those debate topics for many, many years. It would be the highest watch podcast we've ever done. We'd have a great time doing it. It would be a barrel of fun if they got Kyler Murray. Um, and I would respect taking a big swing at a quarterback who is number one overall and has a super arm and can make plays and going for it. That would be going for it. Just like trading up the three is going for it. Same thing with Kyler Murray. I know a lot of you will not be able to stand that idea. And, you know, and, and a lot of you have certainly thoughts, which is always funny to me about Kyler Murray's leadership. It's very odd that people who don't, really watch the Arizona Cardinals seem to have opinions on whether he's a good leader or not. I don't know, but I do know Kevin O'Connell knows uh, Cliff Kingsbury really well. So they would have that uh, Intel. And also you need to keep in mind when you judge Kyler Murray and I look, this isn't going to happen, but I'm just saying when you keep, just keep in mind when judging Kyler Murray, that their general manager, their ownership, just look into their record. Just look into the record of the people who are putting stuff out there about Kyler Murray. Just, just go ahead, check that out. Uh, and, and let's think about like, who's credible here. Um, is, is there truth to all rumors? Sure. There's truth to all rumors, but we know how talented Kyler Murray is. You saw what he did to the Vikings in 2021. You saw the stats that he put up that year. I don't know if you can win a Super Bowl with Kyler Murray. I, I really, I don't because there are limitations, but I also think that he would be the most fun quarterback the Vikings have had since Dante Culpepper. And there would be a roller coaster, wild ride, lots of opinions, lots of arguments, weekly basis, uh, you know, people fighting with each other. But I mean, he's, he's good though. Like he is good. I, I, I don't think he's great. I don't think he's Patrick Mahomes, but he is good. I mean, but all the, all the comments that come out, um, you know, when you guys talk about Kyler Murray, it really seems to me that just, I'm not so sure that like you have any knowledge at all of Kyler Murray, like truly, I just, and it's not, it's not a criticism of the people who are commenting, uh, because why would you watch Kyler Murray? He doesn't play against the Vikings very often. And I don't know why you'd be analyzing him, but I put some thought into this idea earlier last summer and you know, I just, I'm telling you that, so I'll, I'll just give you, this is, this is the purple insider investigation. Okay. Purple insider investigates. Are we going to have to make a thing? Do I have to make a thing? Let me make a thing. This is an, I'm, I'm loving this ticker. I'm making a ticker purple. Hold on. Purple insider investigates. All right. This is investigatory journalism at its finest. Here's what I found. Did I even spell it right? Investigates. Okay. In 2021, Kyler Murray for about 12, 13 games was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL that he was on track to compete for an MVP and was playing dominant football that year, like a number one overall draft pick, like one of the best quarterbacks in the league. And one of the issues that Kyler Murray ran into was the lack of adjustment from his coach, Cliff Kingsbury, that happened every, every time. Is this jumping the shark? No, this is Purple Insider investigates, okay? I'm just laying this out for you. This is what an investigation is. And then you decide, okay? That's how investigatory journalism works. Anyhow. Through about 12, 13 games, they were dominating. They were one of the best teams in the NFL, 2021. And then Cliff Kingsbury did not adapt or adjust his offense, and they slipped toward the end of that year. And they lost to the Rams, who went and won the Super Bowl. So a very, very good Rams team they lost to. And he always got destroyed by Aaron Donald, which everybody did, but he had to play Aaron Donald all the time. And that failure after that, their roster completely corroded the culture of their organization. Go look at their NFL PA. Look at their ratings for the last two years. Total disaster. Total disaster. They, they made bad trades. They made bad moves, bad acquisitions. And their general manager got fired with some very suspicious activity. There has been huge stories about their ownership 
They're one of the worst rated ownership in the entire league. They didn't have a great offensive line. Can you name like what they had DJ Humphreys? Was that their best offensive lineman? They, they had Deandre Hopkins, like what was left of him uh, in 2022. And then Kyler Murray gets hurt. So maybe you would be buying cheaper with Kyler Murray and he's not that old. So we know what's in there. So there you go. That's, that's purple insider investigates is that in 2021, he was one of the best five to seven quarterbacks overall in the NFL. And with him and his ability to throw the ball downfield, his arm strength, his playmaking ability. This is not a real rumor of the day. This is just a mock draft. And then I'm just telling you when I did look into this idea, I thought here's where, here's where we land. Purple Insider Investigates conclusion is under certain circumstances, I think it's a better idea than other things. So if you compared acquiring Kyler Murray versus uh, going into like uh, trading for JJ McCarthy for three firsts, I'm taking Kyler Murray because we have no idea if JJ McCarthy can even play in the NFL especially not right away versus someone that we know is capable of playing at an MVP level. So there you go. There, there is your entire purple insider investigates. And just uh, so you guys also are aware, um, I did figure out how to block people and put them in timeout on the comments. So we'll take care of that uh, as well now. So there, you know, you got to behave or not be a bot. So there's another thing. So anyway, all right, well, let's get, uh, let's get to, to your takes here. I've asked for a ton of stuff. I'm going to scroll back. Um, but let me, let me get some takes on this. Uh, blast on says Kyler Murray are drafting Bo Nix. Kyler Murray, definitely Kyler Murray. Dude, I got to pull this up and just read this to you because it's easy to forget how good he was not that long ago when his team was not a total train wreck. And these other guys, we all fall in love with them based on draft reports. We don't know if they can play. Kyler Murray was the seventh highest graded quarterback by PFF in 2021 overall. He had, listen to this number, 41 big time throws to 12 turnover worthy plays in 2021. The only quarterback in 2021 who had more big time throws was Tom Brady. And his turnover worthy play percentage, let me figure this out, was the fourth best. He was flat out terrific in 2021. If that's the version that the Vikings are getting, and then look, hey, I'm just saying, as Purple Insider investigates, there was another quarterback who I always heard couldn't be a leader and may have said myself on a number of occasions was not capable of leading that ended up getting with Kevin O'Connell and leading. That's see now like now 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 it gets interesting now it's interesting uh matt says investigating how much culture and support system gets mentioned by fans when thinking of a rookie coming in but not if they brought in someone like kyler well that's the point that's yeah that's exactly it is hey well they're going to be able to make the best environment for this guy uh look at kyler murray's environment it was just a shade above urban meyer guys and I'm not even saying that I'm all in on this idea, but if we were ranking all the ideas, so do you draft Bo Nix at 23? Do you trade three firsts for JJ McCarthy? Like I, I got to put Murray above a lot of these ideas. Now, 11th pick for McCarthy. I'd rather do that. Maybe both firsts for McCarthy, maybe, but the guarantee is on the box that this, this player can really play in the NFL where it is not on the box when it comes to anybody else. And uh, I'm reminded constantly by the comment section that people can bust as quarterbacks. Murray also ran for 423 yards that year, five touchdowns. So he was in 2021, did not run quite as much actually was more of a, of a, just a passer that season. and was good. So look, I'm not, this is just a mock draft that Mike Tannenbaum threw out there, but it's an interesting discussion because we have not thought of it. And so I you think that you're, you're ranking this among ideas. So we've heard all these ideas. 
where are we actually putting it? And I wouldn't put it first, but I wouldn't put it last. So <laughs> put on blast and timeout. So, uh, you, you know, I, I think well, with Kyler Murray that he has some special elements to him. I think his arm strength is special. And I think that his running ability is special and no, this is the thing. So, um, reconnected says you want to go back to big quarterback contracts. This is another part of purple insider investigates. So yes, he does have a big contract right now, but I'm saying that there's flexibility to it. I'm also saying it's not my favorite idea. This is not the thing I'm arguing to the death, but let me look this up anyway, since we're talking about it. So Kyler Murray in 2024 is set to have a $49 million cap hit. Obviously that's impossible for the Vikings to, to pay for However, if they restructure, they can chop $29 million off of that. That's what I mean about they made this contract for Kyler Murray where it was very flexible because they weren't completely all in on him and then tried to leak stuff about him that would make him look bad. Uh, again, I'm not saying that I'm 100% in on this. I'm just saying that there are a lot of there are a lot of things about someone like that, that I think have been painted by his former organization that while they may have had shades of truth, there might not have shades of truth here. So, uh, Murray or Herbert, the, the Herbert is, com that's completely crazy because that just can't even happen. Right. But to your question, I mean, I would take Justin Herbert over Kyler Murray, maybe not as much as some other people, but I probably would. Uh, Drew, I agree with you. Uh, Drew says I'm for Drake may. Yes, of course. Uh, that's yes. Um, uh, Kibbeast says, isn't it better to get a rookie quarterback contract and try again if we miss? Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Uh, and you're saying you want a super bowl team. So here is the question is, could a Kyler Murray led offense be good enough to compete for a super bowl, which means we would have to establish what is good enough to compete for a Super Bowl? So let me check out their 2021 offense. They finished 11th in scoring in 2021. And that I think is their highest scoring total. Yeah, they were 13th, 16th. Uh, was he on the team in 2019? Yes, yeah, 16th in 2019. So they have been in a similar spot to where Kirk Cousins was. And what you're saying is probably the, the right answer to this is if you have Kyler Murray, I think that his running ability gives you an extra phase. I think that the weapons the Vikings have are way better than anything he ever had in Arizona. I think the coaching is way better than anything he had in Arizona. It would have to be a bet though, right? It would have to be a gamble that you can go from the 11th best offense up into the top five. Now, I think Murray has the, the talent to do that. I think Kirk was maximizing every bit of his talent. Plus, he's not that old. In 2021, he was 24 years old. So he wasn't even quite at his peak. So there's an argument to be made. But the thing is that if you were to get Kyler Murray, and even if you restructure, he still has a pretty decent size cap hit, still three times bigger than the rookie quarterback contract, and it will take away from other parts of your team. There's no doubt about that. This is not something I am arguing to the death about only kind of intrigued by our perceptions of Kyler Murray. When I think that most of that like perceptions work, right? Like perception is not reality all the time. It's often based on small samples of things that we saw on social media, as opposed to the bigger picture, which would include some really sorted stuff with their general manager and some really messed up stuff with their owner and their facilities and their coaches and all this stuff. Like they just, it's not been good. It has not been good in Arizona for Kyler Murray. I don't think it's been a fair shake, but that's why, I mean, I would prefer if we're making the list to have the rookie quarterback contract, giving up the three first though, you start to dip into having that same sort of problem, right? Where you're giving up a lot. If you're doing it for McCarthy and can McCarthy take you over the hump with his talent. So uh, Reg asks who's making the decision at quarterback KOC or the GM, uh, both is the right answer, but really Kevin O'Connell, it should be, if it's not, then we've got ourselves a problem. 
it really should be Kevin O'Connell, 100%. I mean, they're going to work together on this. And Quasi's role in this, they, they have their roles, is how it should be. Where Quasi and Alfomenza's role is to give them a chance to get Kevin O'Connell's favorite quarterback. And by trading for number 23, he's doing that. And Kevin O'Connell's role is to go get in a room with every one of these quarterbacks that they could potentially draft, bring that information back and say, look, this is how I rank them. This is what we should give up for them. This is how I feel about working with this guy. This guy is completely off my board. Like, here's what we know. Will Levis was not on their board. Otherwise they would have picked him. That was a guy that for whatever reason that Kevin O'Connell did not like and it did not think could be their franchise quarterback. And if you're Quasi at Afo Mensa, I promise you, you are saying to Kevin O'Connell, are you sure? Because getting that guy with our pick at number 23, if he's, if he's a franchise quarterback, that'd be great. But if you're Kevin O'Connell, you have to, you have to put your foot down. If there's a quarterback you don't love, you can't get him. You can't saddle O'Connell with someone that he's not all in on. So he's got to have levels to this. He's got to have, here's the guy I'd give up the three firsts for. Here's the guy I'd give up the two firsts for. And is there someone I'm comfortable with at 11 or 23 if we don't trade down? But really, for me, it is all Kevin O'Connell's decision and Kwesi Adafo Mensa's job is to make it happen. Um, is Kyler Murray too expensive? That's what I was talking about with, he has two years that are very expensive that you can restructure and bring them down by about 20 million. That still ends up being expensive and how they would afford it this year. I'm not really sure, uh, but it's not, it, it's not the same formula as Kirk cousins. That's what I'm saying is because of the way Kirk signed his contracts short term, fully guaranteed that gave no flexibility. There wasn't the same type of restructuring power where you could just move money around and create 20 more million on the cap. And yeah, some of it gets kicked down the road, but you'd be in win now mode. And you'd want to do that. That's probably the biggest argument against it is that, are you ready with Kyler Murray to compete for a championship? And I, I don't know that that's the answer right now. Uh, this is another thing from, uh, Jay Jizza, which is, uh, you can't pay JJ and Murray. You can pay two players on a national football league team. Like you, you, you can like the salary cap is very big and you can have multiple star players, but they don't all get their average annual value. And this is where the salary cap is tricky. You don't get your average annual value every year as your cap hit. So what you would have to do is you would have to structure these things out so they can work in congruence with each other fairly well. And so what happened with the Vikings, this is where they got themselves in trouble. In 2017, they were great. And all the guys from 2015 were up for contracts all at the same time. So they had to pay a bunch of people all at once. So with Jefferson, it's like, he's going this year. Darisaw's going next year. You've got Hawkinson set up. You can restructure some of that. You know, Brian O'Neill, they can restructure some of that so that, that they are sort of coming not all at the same time with the cap hits. So they would have to work it out that Justin Jefferson's maybe comes at a different time, like a little, a little farther down the road where he's being paid the most by the way that you set it up. And you, you know, you're able to put in these restructures. Is it absolutely ideal though? Is it, is it the hack? No, it's not the hack. And that's why I still like the hack the most. I still like trade up for the quarterback, have him on the rookie quarterback contract for those first four years. But where, when Mike Tannenbaum put it out there though, he's a former NFL GM. The only thing that came to mind for me was that sometimes with the Vikings, stuff comes out of nowhere. That's just been who they've been for these last few years with Kwesi Dafomensa and Kevin O'Connell, that the insiders have really struggled with this team because I don't think they like to leak stuff out there. And so they're, they're sort of nibbling at the edges and like, what if this just totally hit us by surprise? Then how would we like, would we like it? Would we hate it? Would we think it was crazy? Would we think they just ruined their franchise or, and as I talk myself through it, I think, yeah, 
uh, it's probably not the most ideal option, uh, but it would create a window for them to still win with the restructure type of money. But it's not my favorite idea. No, because I do think what's going to happen is that you would very likely end up in the same spot as you were with cousins where you're good and not great. So, uh, stop even talking about this digits. My guy, like when someone th- so- says something interesting, that's totally unique in a mock draft that people are talking about and have opinions about, I mean, we gotta, we gotta talk about it, right? Like that's what March is all about. Uh, the, you know, our March madness is, uh, wait, uh, should I, do I, do I need the ticker? I, I think I need the ticker here. Either silly quarterback take alert or rumor of the day. But you know, when people are interested in the subject, that's what we got to do. We got to talk about it. So, you know, it's interesting. I mean, like a lot of people just have a lot of different opinions on Kyler Murray, which I find to be sort of fascinating is that we're all looking at somebody who has been in the league for a few years. And yet at the same time, uh, we are seeing different things. And that's what, you know, I like that about the draft as well. Uh, David says they have the best cap guy in the business. They are all aligned and can really do whatever they want to do moving forward here. If it's one of the first four quarterbacks, do whatever it takes. Yeah. I mean, that's my point about the whole Kyler Murray thing is there's sort of this like door number seven there's cause there's six potential quarterbacks, five that they are believable. Right. And then there's like, I guess it's door number six, but any of the other five quarterbacks you could see happening. And then somebody from the TV throws in this other potential option. I just, you know, all right, well it was, it was only meant to be like a, a quick mention, but then since you guys had so many opinions on it, I thought I would, uh, you know, go through that, but you know, loaded guitars, uh, could bet my life savings. We're not looking for a veteran. No, I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree. This is not a realistic thing. The, the reason that I wanted to bring it up is just because, uh, I think that like this Kyler Murray thing may have had some steam at some point or like as an idea, not as a legitimate report, but like as an idea and we never talked about it. So like, wait, So it gets into like a philosophical, would you take a guy who's pretty young, who's shown he can be really good in an NFL season? So this is, this is a very interesting way to frame the quarterbacks you're looking at in the draft right now. A, would you rather, if you will, like, would you rather have Kyler Murray on his contract or would you rather take what is unknown, but also cheap, but also might cost you a bunch of draft picks. Cheap on the cap might cost you a bunch of draft picks. Are you believing too much in the idea of JJ McCarthy? How many quarterbacks get drafted? And this is only like just weighing this philosophical case, but how many quarterbacks that get drafted will end up being able to take their offense to where he could take it even next year? So uh, I still think that the better idea would be to trade up and take Drake May, even if it takes a lot. If it takes a little less, trade up and get JJ McCarthy. If neither one of them are there and you can't trade up, then take your favorite guy at number 11 are probably all better options uh, than Kyler Murray. But you know, I still think it's, I still think it's quite interesting uh, to discuss. Uh, The book behind me is my book Uh, that is called football is a numbers game where I went through the analytics revolution uh, through the lens of pro football focus and uh, told their story. So that's, that's the book. And if you're going to open the door for promotion, then I'm going to do it. Uh, Loaded guitar says we're due for a top three NFL quarterback. Yeah. I'm sure Chicago feels the same way and all the other teams that haven't had them in a long time, but it does, it does speak a little bit, just a little bit to how in love we fall with ideas of players and what we think they're going to become on draft day during draft season. And then a lot of times by the middle of the first year, we are, you know, completely blown out of the water by what we thought uh, people were going to be. So I know that if they did something like this, that was totally wild 
and they went and got Kyler Murray. That some of you would say you were going to quit uh, watching the Vikings and everything else, but it would it would be a, a very bold move and it would be a very exciting move. And I think they could have a top 10 offense if they did that. Um, but I would prefer to have Drake May. I would prefer to have, if Kevin O'Connell is all in on JJ McCarthy, I would prefer to have that. It's just an interesting little spin that was thrown in there. So, and you would have to trade something for Kyler Murray, of course, which would be part of it. Uh, I don't know what exactly you're, you're trading for him. Um, Matt says in the theme of throwing out quarterbacks who could upset the chat Rattler over Penix and Knicks. I'm convinced we are looking uh, into one of those top four, but why not stir in the pot? Yeah. I mean, for me, the Spencer Rattler thing, I've seen a few draft analysts talk about how much they like Spencer Rattler. And I watched him throw at the combine. And as they say, he can spin it and he doesn't really have like speed <laughs> that you were looking for in a 40. His speed was Drew Bledsoe like. Uh, it was not very impressive, but you know, maybe he's more quickness than speed. I don't know. Quicker than fast is one of those things. There really isn't any evidence of uh, Spencer Rattler ever playing good football, like for any long stretch. There's games where he played well. And at some point, in order to convince me that he's going to be better than guys who played amazing football, it's got to be a crazy toolsy guy. It's got to be Anthony Richardson. It's got to be Cam Newton. It's got to be Josh Allen. If you're going to convince me that someone with a decent sample size and, oh, well, he didn't have offensive linemen. He didn't have this. He didn't have that. But he he, stri he strikes me as somebody who has been a darling. Remember like Jamie Newman? And I think he's better a prospect than that. But Jamie Newman was talked about as like, oh, this mid-round guy. There's a Kellen Mond was this guy. Why am I even reaching for Jamie Newman? Kellen Mond was the, the, the draft, not all the draft analysts, but enough draft analysts and enough people out there were like, oh, well, he's played in this pro system and all this sort of stuff. And they sort of talked themselves into it. I think from boredom, um, I, I, I don't, I, I do not think that Spencer Rattler is like all that good of a prospect, but there's always those, there's always that mid round guy. Was it, I don't know, Ian book or Jake Hayner. Like there's just always every time, uh, there's always that mid round quarterback. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know some of you like are not into the discussion about Kyler Murray, but I think you have to understand like what it's, what it's telling us about the situation you're in. Like if you're comparing ideas of having a quarterback like Kyler Murray, which is the guarantee on the box, it really shows like what your expectations are, your expectations then, because look, if Kyler Murray is capable of taking a team to a a top 10 offense and into the playoffs and being in the top 10 by PFF. And you're saying, no, I don't want that. And is scrambling. It's another 500 yards of scrambling. And you're saying, no, I don't want that. I can do better. That's pretty high. Like that's, that's a pretty high bar that you're setting for this next guy. And I'm not saying you're wrong because I would also choose. And part of it is if you fail, then well, it doesn't mean that no one else can ever play quarterback for your team again. If you fail with picking Drake may or, or whoever, but I, it does, it does say something. And I think all of us believe in the roster strength that if you're going to win a super bowl, that you have to have a total and complete roster, which with Kyler Murray, even though they can restructure would be harder to do, but that's that it's an interesting mind experiment more than it is. Like, Hey, I think they're going to do this. I don't think they're going to do this. That's not what I'm saying. But if we try to, if we make an argument for each case, his might be better than for, you know, some, some other options that we've been talking about and that, that some of you like, so that's all. Uh, let's see. The Broncos are more desperate than us. Uh, you know, trading with the Texans to acquire 23 seems a little desperate, right? I see what you mean that they just had this disaster with Russell Wilson. It feels like that organization hasn't been good in so long. 
But the Vikings don't have a lot of patience here either. They've watched every team in the NFC North run past them. Uh, even you know, Chicago is in a better position than the Vikings are. So they need to play catch up here. Uh, they they need to get back in this race with all these other teams doing things that uh, usually lead to success. And I don't know any better than anyone else if Kyle uh, Caleb Williams is going to be a success. But if he is, then, I mean, you've got at least you could lock in two of the three teams to being really good. And maybe all three would end up being really good. That's something that Vikings have to factor in. Uh, is Kyler Murray enough to take you over the top? Something like that. Probably not. You probably need to have a great complete team, which they are most of the way there because of the offense. And I think because of the offensive coaching, they still need a lot to do though. And the left guard situation, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, 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 we might be looking at a Blake Brandle versus Dan Feeney left guard situation. And I do not like that. That would be not a success for the off season. Maybe Dalton Reisner will come back. I didn't get that impression though. Um, talking to people a little bit at the owners meetings about it just really struck me that Reisner was tweeting about it. And I've never seen that before. <laughs> Uh, did you see Bucky Brooks last mock draft McCarthy going third to new England and may at 11 to the Vikings. Oh, we have may as being the, the dude who drops. That's it. That's an interesting spin. And this is where, this is where the, um, the Intel part of it is hard to figure out, right? Like, do we know the draft order is the McCarthy stuff real is Drake may the one who actually drops and how much. So if you, have you guys ever watched rebel without a cause in rebel without a cause, if you've never seen it, two fellas for no particular reason who are in high school and are just super angsty, they drive toward the edge of a cliff as fast as they can. And one of the guys, I think that maybe his coat gets caught in the door or something and goes over the edge or his foot gets stuck underneath the pedal. Whatever happens, James Dean jumps out of the car. The other guy goes flying over the edge. That's what number 11 drafting would be like, unless they really love Bo Nix and they're not telling anybody. And they uh, are just think like, we'll just stay quiet about it. We'll let everybody else say that we love McCarthy and we'll sit there at 11 and then just take our guy. But that would leave the door open to the Broncos if they like him going up to seven with the Titans. They probably want more draft picks. I mean, where are the Giants in this? Uh, I mean, would they be the team taking him at sixth in that case? Uh, or do you want to do you want to roll the dice and say, you know what? I think that either Drake May or JJ McCarthy will drop to eleven, and we're gonna we're gonna call everybody's bluff. We're gonna call the Giants bluff. We're gonna call the Broncos bluff on trading up. We're going to call Robert Kraft. That's where we started tonight. We're going to call Robert Kraft's bluff. Is, is that what they should do? Call everybody's bluff, ride as fast as they can toward the edge and see who flies over. <laughs> and maybe it's them. Uh, and maybe they end up taking, you know, Byron Murphy there instead of a quarterback. I don't know. I don't know. I wish, I mean, I, I, I both wish and don't wish that draft night was tonight. Like if it was tonight, it'd be great because we could find out, but also I'm just having a great time talking about it. So I guess I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. We've got time to have the most fun off season we've had in a long time. Uh, let's see. Do you think Kirk cousins uh, has a standard typical 500 season in Atlanta? Thanks with a question mark. Uh, is, is the question mark in case I give a bad answer? So, uh, you know, no, I think he'll do better than that. He's got to play the whole season. Like once you get to a certain age, there could be other Achilles is you have two of them. There could be other injury issues that start to crop up. The guy has like been beat to a pulp because of bad guard play for a long time. So if you know, we're talking about normal, healthy Kirk back to hundred percent from the Achilles, which would be a great victory for all football players everywhere in modern science. If that ended up being the case, then I think that they're a, 10 to 11 win team because their division is so unimpressive. And I saw today, Dave Canales, who is, if you didn't know the coach of the Carolina Panthers, 
That must be a tough organization to root for. I, I got to tell you, if we were ranking all 32 teams, the most hopeless feeling Caroline is probably toward the top of that list, but he was talking about reworking Bryce Young's footwork. That sounds really bad. That sounds extremely very, very bad. If you're going into year two with an NFL quarterback talking about how to get him to do the right footwork, like what's happening here? What happened last year? Set this man back. Uh, so they're not much of a threat. I think that the Baker bucks are a eight, nine, seven and 10 waiting to happen. And I mean, we know what Derek Carr is. Derek Carr is going to get hurt again for half the games, or it's going to be banged up for most of the season. And they're going to win eight or nine games too. So I think that Kirk can come out on top of that division. I think they can host the playoff game. Hard to see them going for uh, farther than that. Uh, Jeremiah says, what's the average 40? I assume you mean like running 40 time. Oh, is this a Rattler point? of a Super Bowl winning quarterbacks the last 20 years. Well, when Tom Brady wins all the Super Bowls, you know. Also, we don't do anything. This is like a show rule. We don't do anything based on Super Bowls because Brady and Mahomes won all of them. So I don't know. Is there a model there? Because those guys couldn't actually be more different. And yet they won all the Super Bowls. I, I do know this, that Jalen Hurts was in the Super Bowl. And he runs pretty fast. That's a big part of his game. But if this is a Spencer Rattler argument, I mean, look, uh, Brock Purdy was in the Super Bowl. I think he actually might just be a really good quarterback. He had to run in some key spots. I Almost not every quarterback who reaches the Super Bowl had to be a runner. Matt Ryan was not a runner. He was also 6'4 and is one of the best pocket quarterbacks of the last two decades. So there's that same with like Eli Manning, uh, Philip rivers. These are pocket quarterbacks, but there's also been a lot of really successful scrambling and running quarterbacks. Uh, Lamar Jackson, uh, feel free. And, and Josh Allen, feel free to call them failures because they lose to Mahomes. I'm not going to MVP caliber players. So having mobility and speed, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's helped the Vikings at all to just have your quarterback sit there and someone beats the guard and you lose. And this is something Quasey's brought up and like, he's right that you have to be more than just a pocket quarterback. There has to be an answer when there's pressure. And I don't think Spencer Rattler has an answer. I think that almost everybody else does here. Now does Michael Penix's answer exist in his ability to get rid of the football quickly Bo Nix, though, is a scrambler. Even someone like Bo Nix could scramble. And we know that Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, they all have good speed. That's just how it's mostly going to be for the NFL going forward. It's mostly going to be playmaking. There's going to be playmaking quarterbacks. Every once in a while, a, a pocket quarterback is going to show up. But if you actually watched Brock Purdy play, he was a playmaker. So... um. Yeah, it, look, the NFC Championship, he had to he, he had to scramble for a couple huge plays. Like that's what you need. Uh Daniel says this is the best offseason we've had in years. I am here for the takes. Cherish these days. That is great advice, Daniel. Is that uh when we have things like this random Kyler Murray discussion pop up, lean into it, man. Lean into it cuz it's fun to talk football. Don't take it too seriously. Some of you, I mean, so uh, all, most of you are great about the Kyler Murray discussion, giving your opinions, but some of you seem to be personally offended. Don't be personally offended. It's fun. Uh, Alex says uh, no to Kyler Murray because I want to build a defense in Flores' image. I think that's totally fair. Uh, I think that's totally fair. That is, it's going to still be hard, even if you restructure and even if you create and if you hack off $20 million off of a close to $50 million cap hit, which will put Kyler Murray much lower than some other starting quarterbacks. And I'm sure Arizona is going to do this at some point in the future. They don't have to right now. That's why they're in a good spot, but the plan should still be the plan, right? It should still be the plan, which is to draft the quarterback and build the complete team. Because now what we know is we know that Brian Flores is really good at his job and can take what you have and if what you have is a five out of 10, 
then it's a six or a seven out of 10. If what you had, let's be honest about last year's roster. What did they finish like 12th in points against? What was that year's roster? Maybe the 20th best. There's good players. I mean, there's playmakers and there's guys, you know, 16 and a half sacks from Daniel Hunter. There's great players, but it had a lot of holes still. And it wasn't that different talent wise. Actually, it might have been worse talent wise than what Ed Donatel had. And yet, you you know, you're talking about a much better performance. So I agree with you that I would prefer to see them build a complete roster top to bottom. And if the quarterback is only a seven out of 10, that the team is going to make them into a nine out of 10. And that's what you want. What you want. This is, this is like what San Francisco has. This is the dream scenario. This is why you don't ever hear me criticize Brock Purdy or go into some take about how he doesn't do this. or He's not big enough, whatever. What you want is all the other fan bases to be saying that that team's quarterback. Yeah. He's overrated. He's all the team around him. You're like, thanks. Thank you. That's fantastic to hear because that means you're winning and that means your team is great. That's what you want. You want other fan bases. You want Colin Cowherd or whatever other talking head on NFL live or whatever you want them to be saying, I think he's just a product of what's around him. Cause people think they sound really smart when they say that. So like, that's what you want is to be in that position. Uh, every quarterback for the most part is a product of what's around him. That's why what Mahomes did this year was so wild and Brady a couple times, but most of the time that's the case. And you're trying to build that type of team, which you can, if you have all of that flexibility and look, they have to hit on a few more draft picks and they've got to develop them as well. So there is that. Uh, Digi says our situation is fairly pr uh, precarious. Well, I guess we'll, we'll see if it's precarious. No trade partners at two, three, four, five. And we're looking at Michael Penix or Rattler. What? Well, I mean, this is just my opinion. I just don't think Rattler's in this discussion at all, but, and I also really like Michael Penix. So if you're saying, but this situation is terrible. They're getting Michael Penix. I'm like, I like Michael Penix. So I, I don't know. Um, maybe they don't, or maybe I know you're worried about knees and all that stuff. But so when it comes to the trade partners, well, we just heard today, Robert Kraft say we're open. We've also heard number four, Monty awesome for say we're open. And we've heard number five, Los Angeles say we're open. So there seems to be trade partners. It really comes down to trade price. That is what we're talking about. And where it becomes more precarious is deciding on what the price is and also what price is going to be other teams out. How can you make sure that Denver doesn't find a way? Denver might have a little bit of an ace in the hole with Patrick Sertan. If they were to offer Patrick Sertan and then three firsts or two firsts in a whatever they're lacking second round picks for Sean Payton, I think, but you don't have a Patrick Sertan to trade. I don't think you want to give up Jordan Addison. So that's where it does become a little bit dicey. Uh, this, this is funny. I appreciate this. This talk is better than other podcasts talking about trading Justin Jefferson. Yeah, that was banned. That was banned on the show. Yeah. I appreciate that. We, we banned that a while back. I, I we've been, we've been through that and it, it's just, it's so clear about Justin Jefferson that this is the guy who will make the guy. And I said to someone the other night at this event in the, ownership meetings, which is just random NFL people. I was talking to somebody can't say who, and I was bringing up the point about Nick Mullins and Justin Jefferson. And like, because those games didn't matter, we don't appreciate them enough for what this man is capable of for elevating a quarterback. And I wouldn't trade that player for almost anything except for Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. That's probably it. Maybe burrow. I don't know. Stroud probably, but not much more than that because that player is so capable of elevating quarterbacks. And that's what I'm saying is what you want is to draft JJ McCarthy and then have people who make rankings on the internet in July be like, I'm only putting him at my 14th best quarterback because of the team around him as you win 13 games. That's what you're looking for. Let everybody say you're overrated because you have a good team around you. That's what you're looking to do. 
uh, or just have somebody who becomes Mahomes. But you know, that's not always the most realistic thing. Like that's the that is the rarest of the rare. So the next best option, I should say, is for everybody to claim that your quarterback is overrated because of what's around him. That's what that's what you hope for. Uh, because that means you went somewhere and they're talking about you constantly and they're trying desperately to create a debate topic uh, out of your quarterback because you're relevant as opposed to Kirk Cousins where what was the debate? I mean, some people tried to make it into one, but we all knew what it was uh, at the end of the day. Alexander says the ceiling of this team in 2026 is a top five offense, a top five defense with a rookie quarterback that hits. That is the path, my friend. That's what you're looking for. Now, building a top five defense is hard because usually it takes defensive tackle who's going to be a beast, and that is an obsession of mine as the defensive tackle position. I was just watching on my flight, uh, so I got I got the YouTube version where you can download videos just for flights so I could download a football life uh you know, the movies, uh, the uh, documentaries of football life. And I was watching Joe green, mean Joe green. It's really good. So you should check it out. There's some, there's mean Joe green killing the Vikings a bunch of times in there, but the defensive tackle position is, is absolutely vital. And the, just watching those highlights and it still exists today. When you have that guy who can just break through the line right away, there's nothing quarterbacks can do. There's no stepping up. There's no rolling out. It's just like right up the middle. They need, you know, I think a better cornerback group, a uh, little, little more, a lot more depth, I think. So, but are they a year or two away with development, with a couple more draft picks hitting? And I think what Brian Flores gives you is, is rational belief. So there's like rational and irrational. So there's like hope. Well, the irrational belief is just hope, right? So it's like just hope versus versus belief, uh, where you have this hope that they could build a defense versus now after seeing the development and the players that Brian Flores brought in and seeing them succeed, then you have belief in it. So I think that's, that's where that's changed and you can buy into that. I think we also know another thing is important to mention. I think we also know Brian Flores is not getting a head coach job. It's just not going to happen. Not with where they stand presently uh, with him suing the NFL. And even if he does not win his lawsuit, or drops his lawsuit against the NFL. He went on national television and talked about some things that I think would make owners very uncomfortable and it would be a pretty tough sell. And I, we saw him get some interviews that were probably meant to just make sure that like he, they didn't get accused again. So they gave him some interviews two years ago, no interviews this year. And that is unfortunate for Brian Flores. Cause I think that he's qualified capable, very talented coach, but their loss is your gain. And this is somebody who you don't have to talk yourself into. We don't have to play that game. Um, who cares about left guard for 2024? Go buy one in 2025. I do. Um, because your quarterback might be inexperienced and I don't love the idea. Like Kenny Clark still plays for the Packers. So I don't love the idea of, JJ McCarthy dropping straight back and finding somebody in his lap that he wouldn't have ever seen before at Michigan. A little concerned about that. I, I don't know what would have been a better option when I look at those prices. Kevin Zeitler was only six million bucks, but he was going to Detroit the whole time. He was looking for a team that's on the cusp of being a potential Super Bowl contender. So he went there to try to probably aim for a Super Bowl. It wasn't going to come to Minnesota, even if they offered him more money. The other guys went for too much money. And I'm sure the Vikings didn't have them evaluated that high. And they kind of got left holding the bag a little bit with this left guard situation. And it just, you had, if you had more confidence in right guard, it would be like, all right, well, there's one position where there's a battle, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in right guard either. And we've been through that. I know that you get a quarterback who's more mobile to run away. And this has been a, a long time thing with the previous quarterback is running away when there's pressure, say on fourth and eight from the right guard position, but they shouldn't have to run away all the time. Yeah. That right. You don't want the, you don't want them constantly scrambling, constantly having hands in their face. They're trying to throw the football. 
that's just something they're going to have to work through because I don't know what the better option was based on the prices. Still, it's 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 not good. It's when we're grading the whole off season, kind of all the different things that they did or didn't do. Not finding that guy at left guard is still not a not a great success. And maybe Reisner will come back and he'll be good at least at pass protection. And you could kind of split the difference there and run to the right side. Um, I might actually be in support of that now. I was not in support of that so much before because I, I really would like to see them improve the running game. But when we're talking about if it's a rookie quarterback starting, they need better pass protection. Um, at the time, I uh, Daniel says, at the time I felt we lost a great future GM in George Payton. How would you rate his time in Denver? I think that George Payton got a tough deal. Now, number one, who among us would not have traded for Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, before Denver traded for him, was great. He had that thumb injury. It kind of hurt him a little bit, but that was a random thing. I think he hit it on a helmet or something. But aside from that, the end of his 2021 season, he came back too early, but then when he got healed, he was the old Russell Wilson. He was great. I think he just hit a wall, and that happens. It happened to Donovan McNabb. It's happened to many quarterbacks before. One year, they're great. The next year, they can't play anymore. Randall Cunningham from 98 to 99. One year, he's great. The next year, he can't play at all. What the heck happened? But age is a funny thing. It doesn't just slowly notch down every single year. Sometimes you're cruising along totally fine, and then you fall off the edge of the earth. And I don't know how George Payton would have known that that was going to happen. So I felt bad for him in that, that situation because 100 out of 100 of us would have traded for Russell Wilson for the Denver Broncos. He looked like the final piece for them. It looked like a team, a team that was going to be really good. I think that what did they win like seven or eight with um, Teddy Bridgewater? So, Hey, if you can win eight with Teddy Bridgewater, then you can win 10, 11, 12 with Russell Wilson. And it just, they hired the wrong coach. Wilson wasn't the same guy. And George Payton looks bad because his quarterback decision went bad. And that's just the reality for everybody. Uh, there in the NFL, like, look, his, his, his time in Denver is an F of course, it's way, way, way worse than they ever thought. It's just that he did something very logical that didn't work. And then they bring in Sean Payton and he runs the organization. I mean, that's, I don't think George Payton will be the GM for that long there because Sean Payton is the GM. Uh, Brady, uh, Bradley, sorry, says, Denver will have to give up uh, four firsts to overtake the Vikings to move up into the top four. What you think? What I think is that you might be right because if the Vikings gave up 11, well, this is where they have to put a player in there. Uh, if the Vikings gave up 11, 23 in their next year's first, that is a heck of a heck of a package to offer to anybody in the top four or five, depending on what they think they need to do. And maybe they're still trying to make those phone calls to number two. I I don't know. But uh, Denver, yeah. I mean, if they threw in their, their first four, that's not as good as having two firsts this year and a first the following season. What Denver can give up is, is a player. One particular player who is really, really good. Uh, they have one of the few true shutdown cornerbacks in the NFL. And they can trade that in order to try to get their quarterback and New England has a long history of having these great corners. Stefan Gilmore, Akib Tlaib before that, Ty Law, like it goes back. McCourty uh, for a long time with these great corners. And they've always been connected to why they have a really good team. And th they might look at that and say, well, that's better because that's a sure thing. Although I, you have to pay them, but they're not paying anybody right now because they stink. Uh, Connor Williams for left guard, yeah. So Connor Williams is, uh, it's an interesting one because, you know, Connor Williams is been banged up and that's a problem uh, that he's been banged up and he's got this knee injury. And uh, I mean, that would make me nervous, a guard coming off of a knee injury. Uh, I'm really sorry that uh, the stream went robot voices on you guys. Sorry that happened. Uh, hopefully we're, we're okay now. As far as the stream goes, uh, every once in a while, you know, can get a little wonky every once in a while. That is just the, uh, the internet. 
Uh, Miles says, uh, May Daniels, and I've come to an understanding if we took Michael Penix. I think with any one of these guys, you can talk yourself into it with any one of these guys. I mean, because if it's Drake May, you could say, look, look at the arm, look at the playmaking. If it's Daniels, that's absolutely special when it comes to his running ability and his deep ball. And he also just was very safe with the football this year. And with Penix, you're probably getting him at number 23, which means you get to take a defensive tackle at number 11 or, or Bo Nix the same way. And look, Penix led the nation in passing. So we're talking about if that's the case, if you lead the nation in passing, well, I'll, I mean, that, that guy, like you, you got to feel at least decent about that. Um, yeah, I know that there have been bad quarterbacks who have, but with that arm to be able to do that. So I've been, so, you know, takes a team to a level they've never been before. So I've been sold on, on a lot of these ideas because I think that with this year's draft class, and I was asking people about it everywhere I go, asking people about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, like the, it's, I think that the consensus is that it is a good draft class, that it isn't just sort of a smoke screen as we've talked about. Matt says my inner Vikings fan is already slightly preparing for the sting of seeing may go number two and the buzz mostly being around Daniels and JJ and Washington, especially, uh, or, uh, yeah, yeah. With, oh, with the buzz being, well, that's, you know, Eric eager brought up a really good point is just that where Adam Peters comes from the GM now, uh, that like they usually don't leak stuff, but also if we put like, I mean, all the pieces together, they really look more like Jaden Daniels than they do Drake may. I, I don't know that that's true. It's just kind of the way that they've put this together and the fact that they brought in Mariota and the fact that they brought in Kingsbury, who's worked with the running and playmaking quarterback, that all kind of pushes it toward that direction. That's how I'm feeling right now. But is it very possible that on draft night, this is what the Vikings are waiting to find out is, okay, are you guys going to draft May? Or are you guys going to draft Daniels? And then we decide as the, you know, the, if, if we're the Vikings front office, then we decide what's going to happen next. Like, do we trade up or do we wait? Uh, Miles says, uh, how excited do you think the organization will be to play the Falcons this year? The defense should be dialed in. Yeah. You know, there really isn't a great revenge angle for Kirk because like, what are you getting revenge on? I was wondering this though, uh, myself, somebody brought this up, the reaction to cousins coming back to us bank stadium. It, I think he gets a big cheer. I, I don't think that the whole, I don't think it's an aggressive enough city cities to boo the heck out of, uh, Kirk cousins, but maybe I, I don't really have a, a feeling about what that stadium is going to be like, because I think most people wanted it to work with Kirk and generally liked him overall. And so they'll probably be like, yeah, all right, welcome back kind of thing rather than, you know, boo or whatever, you know? So, uh, it is true that Matthew Stafford was slow and, and won a super bowl is so we're, we're, out, we're uh, I, I haven't been scrolling fast enough. We're at a slow quarterbacks that won super bowls. Yeah. Yeah. Some slow, Slow quarterbacks did go to some Super Bowls. That's true. Joe Flacco, that was a long time ago. Uh, Kerry Collins was in a Super Bowl. Trent Dilfer, did anyone mention? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the game, the game, playmaking is the thing. Like, Joe, is Joe Burrow the fastest quarterback you've ever seen? No, but he's a great playmaker, and you, you have to be at least that. Uh, so you have to be at least, at least a great playmaker. <laughs> um, so I was watching, I, uh, I made a joke about Ben Franklin in the time zone. And, uh, Mike says Ben Franklin died long before time zones were created. Just saying now that would, uh, the movie I watched on the plane would be inaccurate if that's true. Uh, because the movie was, I was watching national treasure, Nicholas cage, not a good movie, but 
it's all they had. So I just watched it. But uh, in the movie, I think they claim that Ben Franklin was responsible for time zones. So I, I don't, but I, unlike the office, I'm not like that, that Ben Franklin character or the guy who played Ben Franklin. Uh, Sue says, um, imagine if, uh, we were still talking about cousins and how to improve the team. Well, I bet about 300 of you wouldn't be here if that was the case based on my previous numbers while we were still, uh, battling through that. So welcome everybody to the quarterback talk and the most fun off season we've had in a long time. Uh, glad we have an awesome off season, like now with all the speculations. Yeah, that's a, it's just a a big part fundamentally of um, like football and what it is, is, and what I like about it is that football fans in general are so informed, so knowledgeable about the league, the teams, and, and, I, and like there are baseball fans who are, but generally speaking, if I asked what the Arizona Diamondbacks need for their lineup, none of us would have any idea because who cares? But if I ask you what the Arizona Cardinals need, you'd know because everybody pays attention to the NFL and everybody can have an opinion. We all watched college football. We've all watched the highlight reels. We've all looked at the salary cap. We've all listened to the coach talk at the podium and listened to the analysts and read the articles and everything else. And so uh, when everybody in the room here, when all of you folks in the room uh, can all have an informed opinion or a very high percentage of you makes for some really, really good discussion, I think. And that's what we're having here when you have such a great topic uh, like, you know, potential quarterback. Uh, let's see. Digit says, I suspect time zones would have become relevant with the advent of the telegraph. Okay. Somebody uh, who knows history is going to have to tell us more about time zones and telegraphs. Okay, here we go. Time zones were created in November 1883. Why? Why were they created? Was it the telegraph? That's a great question. Just lost a thousand viewers, by the way. Just all tuned out when we started talking about this. Uh, Christian says, National Treasure was uh, a treasure for me growing up. I think I've seen the movie 20 times. Um, sorry. I said it wasn't that great. Uh, I don't think it's going to win any Academy Awards. Um, now we're into national treasure takes. It was inaccurate, but great. Icon eye, eye candy it for an airplane movie. I have different levels of things like I do with sports. So a couple of times I foolishly watched like Academy Award winning movies on planes. And I felt like such a dope. Why did I do that? It's like edited to fit on the little screen. What am I? So I was sitting in the, uh, the exit row where you can't close, or at least I couldn't close the window. So I'm only seeing like two thirds of it because there's a reflection in the glare. What am I doing? So I try to find something that's kind of fun, kind of entertaining. But if I'm like looking around at stuff, if I'm interrupted by, you know, do you want a drink or a snack or whatever that I'm not going to be bothered because sometimes I would get like really intense into this. And uh, then I'd be like, wait, what am I doing? Like, there's, there's too many distractions. There's kids on this plane coming from Disneyland. Like, so I'll watch national treasure and it was, it was fun. It, it It's not going to win any Academy awards, but it was fun. So there's my, uh, as a constant traveler, there's my philosophy. I agree with this, Randy. I think the revenge angle is Zimmer versus Kirk. Yeah, because nobody has made any bones about it, about how those guys feel about each other. It ain't good. And everybody knows it. Everybody. It was not some secret. See, that's circling back to the Kyler Murray stuff. It's all like innuendo and you can't figure out if they were just blaming him or what for their own ineptitude, because there's no smoking gun there. There's no like very clear and obvious what it was you're talking about as well. Is he the right leader? Is he whatever? And well, there are truth to all rumors. I, I am like skeptical about that a little bit more because nobody loves anything more than NFL people and the blame game. So, so, so I hesitate with something like that, but 
uh, when it comes to Zimmer and cousins, no love lost between those two. That's my revenge game. That's the one where I'm hoping that that's on national TV so I can get home from whatever Vikings game I'm covering and turn on Kirk versus Zimmer. That is put it on the marquee for me, not Kirk versus the Vikings. Kirk versus the Vikings is like, okay, I guess so. But they like him. Like, it's not, what kind of rivalry is fun if they like him? Oh, yeah, Kevin O'Connell's like his best buddy. Like, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, if Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier were like friends, that wouldn't have been as fun, right? So uh, Alexander says, uh, I'm getting my hopes up for Drake May, not going to lie. I created him on Madden and won the Super Bowl as a rookie. A rookies usually don't win the Super Bowl. How dare you do something on a video game that is historically inaccurate? Although maybe uh, he could have taken him to the next level. No, but the May point is so long as Robert Kraft is out there saying we're open and so is the possibility of Drake May not being number three or two, which does exist. And there's rumors on that as well that it's possible and it's also in my opinion the best fit so uh, if we're doing like percentages for drake may i'm not going to give it 70 percent that he's the vikings quarterback but maybe it's 25 i'll have to do a pie chart i'll have to work but if i'm doing a pie chart i'm not doing off the top for quarterbacks that'll be a whole episode i'll do the pie chart for a whole episode uh anthony says uh, no matter who we get as our next quarterback Kevin O'Connell better finally figure out the run game. Yes. To give our offense more balance. I don't want to see any quarterback dropping back 40, 55, uh, 45 to 50 times a game. That I believe is what Mr. Aaron Jones is here to do. That Aaron Jones is here to make sure that they are not dropping back uh, 45 times a game and not having a running game. That's, that's his job. And it's also to pass protect as well. That's important and catch the ball uh, that that was one thing last year about Alexander Madison. that totally shocked me that he just did not catch the ball this year. And in previous years he did. I, I don't know what happened there. That was that in my opinion was him putting too much pressure on himself. Aaron Jones does not put too much pressure on himself. The dude's a star. He's going to catch the ball when you throw it to him. Madison, how many first downs did they lose? Because Madison dropped balls and Osborne dropped balls. So it's not just the running game, but the pass, pass protection and the screen game. Uh, Dennis says all six quarterbacks go in the first round. Knicks at 12 and Penix to the Raiders. Yeah, that is, I mean, in the realm of possibility, if we're looking at all the scenarios, yeah, that is uh, one potential scenario. Yeah, um, that that could happen. That would be pretty crazy. I think there's going to be one guy that the league doesn't love that we've talked about. There's always one, right? And there's never been more than five in the first round. I guess there could be this year, but that would make for I mean, what a league shifting draft that would be if there are six quarterbacks. I mean, that's why when we're talking about how exciting it is, it's actually a topic of discussion, how exciting it is, because there is that potential for there to be more quarterbacks taken than there's ever been before. Uh, Heat Grimm says, are you a strat guy or a Les Paul guy or something else like PRS? Uh, this is a guitar question. It comes up every once in a while. Uh, so I have, I have a bunch of different uh, guitars. I don't have a Les Paul though. So I'm not like those people are really into it. So are the PRS people. The PRS people are obsessed with PRS. I don't have one of those. I have a couple of Yamahas that I think are underrated, uh, a Schecter Super Strat uh, style that I've been playing quite a bit. Uh, I have a Telecaster and I have a Kramer that has the hockey stick that I bought after Eddie Van Halen passed away. So I've, I got a bunch of them. Uh, they're all types of different styles and stuff, but I don't have a Les Paul. Maybe I need to get one. Los Lobos. I worry that if we're unable to trade up, we might not be able to wait until the 23rd pick. Yeah. So that is something that I was thinking about the other day. What do they do if they can't trade up, but they get to number 11 and the number one defensive player in the draft is on the board. This would be like picking number one. If there weren't all these quarterbacks and receivers and it's, I don't know who it is. Dallas Turner. 
Let's just say it's Dallas Turner. How do you not take Dallas Turner if you think that Bo Nix or Michael Penix could get there? And I, that would be hard not to do, right? But they could also move up from 23. And you do have to worry about the Broncos and you do have to worry about uh, the Raiders. As you mentioned, the Raiders are in position to draft quarterback. That's what makes it tough is that like the Raiders are a team that should so obviously be picking a quarterback. How do you end up getting all the way to where the Vikings will be picking at 23? And there's nobody to really, there's nobody to trade up with. So if you want to pick at 11, it's not like you could trade up to 12 because 12 could be taking a quarterback as well, but maybe just throw out crazy stuff. Like maybe the Broncos already traded up. Like, I don't know. You probably just have to take the guy at 11, even if you like a defensive player more. Uh, Train schedules, railroads. Oh, that's why I didn't know that. I I didn't. I also didn't know that. a lot of you really liked national treasure. Okay. It was very hot for a summer telegraph first, then railroads talking about time zones. Uh, the Eastern time kills me every time I go out there, it's harder than West coast. I feel like more jet lag when I come back from Eastern 1883 union Pacific railway is from bench 295. And yes, baby telegraph was a part of it, uh, but primarily the union Pacific railway. Okay. So why though? Like why, like what does the railway have to do with time zones? I don't really get it. Um, national treasure and day after tomorrow. I've seen too many times I've seen day after tomorrow outside of my window. Uh, no, it was a good movie. I saw that in the theater when it came out. Tony says not too stressed about quarterback. Finally be- believe in the people making the decisions. This, this, yes, this, this right here, this right here, the way that they've gone from point A to point B has been so direct, like the trains, you might say like a union Pacific train that they have not had bizarre off ramps. They haven't done strange things that didn't make sense. Even when they signed someone like Marcus Davenport, like it made sense, but it didn't work, but you could get it. It was not a big commitment. It wasn't a huge dollar figure. It was like short term. Let's take a shot see if he could go back to 2021. He didn't do it. That's life. But there's, there hasn't been anything along the way outside of that 2022 draft, which was just their first, just starting out. But as far as the whole path goes, there's not a lot you can look at and say, well, that made no sense. There were a lot of things with the end of Spielman and Zimmer where it made no sense. So you start to believe in, their decision-making prospect. I'm getting railroaded. That's very funny. Uh, you start to believe in their uh, decision-making process when the decisions make sense and we can talk through them logically and we can break them down into, all right, here's what they were thinking when they decided to trade for 23, when they decided to move on from Delvin Cook, when they decided to, you know, whatever, let Daniil Hunter go sign Jonathan Grenard doesn't mean everything will work. It just means it all fits together. And that makes you feel more confident in what they're going to do next. I don't know how much really weighs the odds though, because a lot of it is just hoping and praying. But with Kevin O'Connell, one thing that I think we can project is he's going to pick somebody who he can communicate well with and feels like he sees the same things. So in these draft meetings, putting kind of the headset on almost, Like this is like O'Connell seeing through your eyes. And if you can get on the same page with that, you can have success. Even if the guy has some shortcomings, Thor says, uh, speaking of revenge, any chance Harbaugh won't trade with the Vikings. Oh yeah. Jim Harbaugh petty. There's definitely a chance of that. (laughs) There's definitely a chance of that. Uh, I, yeah, I'd be surprised if they did, but he's not the GM, but we know he's the GM. So yeah. I think that there might be a bit of a grudge there. No guarantees. Maybe, maybe he's not that, maybe he's not a grudge holder. I don't know. Jim Harbaugh is a hard guy to pin down, right? Does anybody feel like they know Jim Harbaugh? I don't. I would just think that he's so competitive that he'd be like, I'm not trading with the team that didn't hire me. 
Uh, let's see. What about Bob says, Matt, were you there for the Kirk extension press conference? I've, I've been there for every press conference, man. Since 2016, I, I could count on one hand, the press conferences I haven't gone to. So yeah, the, the Kirk, the Kirk first, the, fr do you mean extension or you mean the, the first contract he signed? Because this has been a long joke between us writers is when they signed Kirk to his initial contract and Zimmer came up to the podium and he talked about how good Kirk was at running bootlegs. And we just like, that's the best he could come up with is that he just like, he was clearly not for that decision uh, that like he never wanted them to pay the quarterback all the money and then lose his defensive players. Uh, Blowfisher says Zimmer doesn't hate Kirk. He hates the fact Spielman forced the vast contract on his team. I don't know about that. I just, I don't think, I don't think that was a good relationship. I don't think that was a good relationship at all. Okay. I know that wasn't a good relationship. <laughs> I know that wasn't a good relationship. Uh, Kirk was not Zimmer's type of guy. Zimmer's type of person was much more Sam Bradford, Teddy Bridgewater, sort of these natural leaders. Like Sam Bradford had this, this cockiness about him, this confidence about him that even though he hadn't turned out to be the number one pick that people thought he still felt that he was that guy. And he led like that once he got an opportunity to do so, once he went through that 2016 season, that was such a whirlwind. But when he got to 2017 and he went through that training camp that I have brought up, you know, a number of times on the show, but you really saw him take command of that team and cousins didn't naturally do that. And I think needed some pushing from his coach that he didn't get. And of course, Teddy was one of the greatest leaders I've ever been around and just so natural the way that he makes people around him better, the way he connects with people. That's a real thing. I've written articles about, it. I've talked to players about it, coaches, everybody. And I think Zimmer, Z that really mattered to Zimmer, the way that Teddy just said, like, this is my team. And that Kirk was, he came out and said that he felt like it wasn't his team when he got there because there were other leaders and that I think that drove someone like Zimmer crazy. So the, the contract, the players on defense, they lost all that stuff. But I also think just personality conflict. There are quarterbacks who get along with Zimmer. Kirk was not one of them. And then when the big mistake was not getting Kirk, because you didn't know that when you got him, the big mistake was not moving on when you realized that wasn't going to work. That's where it was the big mistake. Um, let's see. Uh, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure how to say your name, uh, says, uh, at first I thought Quasi was really bad. <laughs> this is why I told you by the way, and I'll get to the rest of the comment in a second. This is why I was saying throughout the season, we have to give it time. We just have to give it time. We don't like to give things time. We don't like to give the Justin Jefferson time. When people want to talk about trading him. You know, we don't like to let things play out. We like to overreact. And the same thing might go for, you know, they haven't traded up yet. And like, we'll see. So my thing was, there's been good. There's been bad. There's an idea here. Let's see if they execute it. Now that they've executed, it looks pretty good, which I think is what you're saying. So Aya says, uh, at first I thought uh, Quasi was really bad. Now I see he drew a line in the sand and cut overpriced, uh, underproducing players. Now we'll get to see how he is on drafting. Drafting is the inexact science of all time inexact sciences. The quarterback pick is going to be a Kevin O'Connell, Wilfs, Quasi, Triumvirate pick. But it's really, I mean, really much more Kevin O'Connell. But it's going to be how they handle the situation with the trade-ups also goes into Quasi as well. This is, for me, this is a, it's a full franchise leadership pick for the quarterback. Now, can they find guys that could be developed? Because we haven't seen a lot of that yet. Ty Chandler. Is probably the best we've seen. Uh, they, last year, though, I mean, we saw Addison and we saw Ivan Pace Jr., who counts as part of the draft class. I don't know. People don't like that. But when you get to undrafted free agency, you have to convince that player to sign with you and you have to invest the money to get them to do that. And they invested more money in Ivan Pace Jr. than I've ever seen them before for an undrafted free agent. So you have to make that move in the draft and, and make that work. So you get credit for that 
for the undrafted free agents, the same way that like, look, Rick gets credit for Adam Thielen, you know, like Adam Thielen, they found him, they gave him a chance and he turned out to be great. So they get credit for that. Uh, you get credit for your undrafted free agent. So they've, and, and it's similar to other stuff. There's been some good, some bad in the draft. Makai Blackman doesn't get enough attention. He was one of the top graded PFF. Yeah, he, he got Moss that one time, but he was uh, one of the top PFF graded cornerbacks among rookies last year for how much he played. And so, th- you know, they may have hit on three players from last year with uh, Ivan Pace and then Blackman and Jordan Addison, that's good. We're just going to need a bigger sample though. That that's the thing. We're just going to need a bigger sample for drafting to try to figure out like how they go about it. And I, and, and same with anything else. I want it to be a logical, logical process. That's, that's all I'm looking for here because sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't 2022 was not a logical process to me. Drafting a safety, drafting a guard, like these, uh, the, the, that was not good positional value. I think, uh, reaching big time on the guard, the safety safeties are very much like circumstantial based on how, what's in front of them, what's with them, like what they're asked to do, stuff like that. Uh, you don't watch movies on a plane. You like to read a good book about football. Any ideas? Well, that sounds like promotion time to say, Football is a numbers game. The book that I wrote is a great choice. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Uh, Matt says, feels like you have to take a shot on elite traits and top 10 upside. That's May to a T. Daniels has elite traits, but frame. Uh, yeah, I mean, his his the amount of times he gets. I'm not sure what you mean by P, PTS rate, uh, but the amount of times that he gets like clobbered is a potential issue. I still like Daniels. I just think uh, who knew Matthew Van Halen? Look, someday, someday in the summer, I'll bring the guitars down here and we'll shred it up. I can play a lot of Van Halen. I've been playing since I was like 12. So I can do a lot of things on that. Uh, Let's see. Digits wants to uh, take the defensive pick and then quarterback at 23 but you have to be concerned that your quarterback might not be there at 23. And that's where, that's where you're worried about it. Ideally, ideally. Oh, pressure to sack rate. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Daniels has the very concerning pressure to sack rate. If you were to live in an ideal world in a magic land that you could just, you know, twiddle your fingers and you get everything you want, then you would get Drake may at 11 and then at 23, you get like Johnny Newton from Illinois and or Byron Murphy. And then you feel like a God like that. Then you win the whole draft. Like that's what that's what you would ideally want. And, you know, whether that's possible, I, I'm not sure to get the quarterback there. But I don't think you could take the defensive player at 11 and risk all the quarterbacks being off the board or not getting anyone that you even like. Uh, all right. Couple more minutes. I've been up since six o'clock Eastern, guys. Look at all this football talk. How much fun is this? Uh, Andrew says, imagine the Vikings trade up to five, then again to three and the giants trade to four and this being, uh, so it would go bears, commanders, Vikings, giants, and it would go Williams, Daniels to the Vikings made to the giants, maybe flip those for me. And then, uh, or, or, oh, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading this wrong. So Daniels to the commanders. Okay. Sorry. You meant Williams to the bears. Commanders take Daniels, Vikings take May, right? Then McCarthy goes to the Patriots. Yeah, I mean, it's not crazy because that also is part of the potential holdup, right? If the Patriots want to move back, do they want to move back as far as 11 or would they be wanting to also go back up? So back and then back up, which is what Miami did. Um, And there's so many moving parts to this. And that's what, it's exactly what, um, who was saying this, uh, Kevin O'Connell just said, there's a lot of layers. There's definitely a lot of layers. Frank says he's leaning J uh, JJ McCarthy over may if Williams and Daniels are off the board, but having McCown on the staff and the ability to let these guys sit for a year, they could roll with either of the young guys. Well, McCown will have the Intel on Drake may like, is he the type of guy that they want or not? Uh, so, (laughs) 
uh now now we're all in the guitar stuff uh i play a mean dime bag you mean dime bag daryl domination solo i look i, I could shred the thing i could shred the thing i could play a little dime bag daryl a little cemetery gates for you i can do that so anyway uh let me answer to let's see one or two more let me answer this one um randall says don't drake may and and mccarthy seem like the best fits for koc at this very moment the one guy that i would not count out is bo nix and i don't think that bo nix is going to be great but i've i still am not backing up like i'm not backing off my nix and Penix being good prospects i'm not backing off i still think that they're good like good prospects overall they might go in the third round i might look foolish i don't care i i it's just Look at the numbers. Look at the way they play. I like them both. But Bo Nix has been the favorite choice of former quarterbacks. And I brought this up because it's so interesting that when former quarterbacks watch Bo Nix, they, they do video pieces about how much they like him, including Kurt Warner, who's obviously no joke. Uh, so, like, what is Kevin O'Connell? Former quarterback. But if we're only talking in terms of, look, there's a clear number one, then there's a second tier of Daniels May, and then there is McCarthy in his own tier, and then there's a pretty steep drop off in the other two. If we think that, which we're often wrong, but if we think that that's the case, then the answer is yes. That from the second tier, May is a better fit than Daniels, and that McCarthy is a better fit than Nix or Penix. It's just like that makes logical sense based on what we think we know. I still like Nix and Penix. I'm still skeptical about McCarthy, but if Kevin O'Connell wants him, then uh, my rankings for fit. I mean, just throwing Caleb Williams out of the conversation because he's the best for anybody, I think, for prospect wise. I would have Drake May number one and fit. Yeah, I mean, McCarthy feels like a better fit, but also I think like Nick's threw on time and there's always this big discussion about throwing on time. It's probably May, McCarthy, Nix, Penix. But Penix has that huge arm. But I think they want someone who can make a play. If I had to guess, I think that fourth and eight probably sticks in them as much as it sticks in you. And they want somebody to make a play. So, you know. Anyway, well, let's end on this. Drew's hitting it right. And I uh, all the comments that I did not get to, I try to get to as many as I can, but you guys are coming fast and furious today with all sorts of good stuff. And I, I didn't have a chance to see the kick returners you mentioned. I'm going to have to go back and look at that. Um, you know, I, there, there, there are people who like Nick's. I mean, John says Nick's threw on time, always threw from dirty pockets more times than not. Uh, he had a good offensive line, but, uh, and he had a good offensive system and playmakers and all that. But, he got the ball out and that just, there's something aesthetic about a guy getting the ball out that I like that maybe I'm overrating, but I mean, it's not like this guy came out of nowhere. He was, he was a good prospect coming out of high school and eventually became what they thought he could become. And then it's still like not good enough. I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll stick with some of these takes and see how they work out and maybe I'll be completely off and then we'll talk about why, but we'll end on this. And there's lots, lots to come this week. Uh, we'll see, see what I got cooking up maybe for tomorrow. I don't have anything scheduled uh, for tomorrow at the moment, but Thursday I got a couple of podcasts to record with some very good guests. Um, so we'll go through that and we'll try to bring you as many perspectives as we can. I think maybe, maybe I got to get Manny back, back on because I know you guys miss Manny. So let me wrap on this though. Uh, Drew says, can't wait for April 25th. There you go. I'm assuming that's the date of the draft. I haven't looked. It's in a month. All right. Uh, you guys are the best. Two hours of football talk off of the owners' meetings. Who are we? Who are we these days? I didn't even go to the owners' meetings in previous years. Now I'm going and we're talking for two hours about it. Very exciting times in Vikings land. And tomorrow, if uh, we're going live tomorrow, let's see how it plays out because we got to make sure we have one of these one of these rumor of the day. And maybe we have like a smoke screen to work with. So we'll see. 
We'll see how it turns out, but uh, at very least, uh, we'll keep it rolling here on the channel. So thanks so much to everybody for listening slash watching, and we will see you all again very soon. Football!